What's going on guys, it's JackGirls1875 here and before I jump in explaining what today's video is going to be all about, which I think by the picture and by the title you should have began to figure it out by now, but before I jump in, I'd like to apologise for not uploading last week of tested positive for Euros fever and it's been an absolutely amazing competition so far. We've seen some great football played. Um, we've been seeing some great moments like Germany standing up for pride and when all, the whole sort of football world gathered around for Christian Eriksen. So it's been a great competition so far and sort of restored a bit of faith in humanity. Some great football being played and the knockout rounds are going to be really, really tasty. You can tell, especially that Germany-England time there. My only disappointment with Scotland, it's still been a great competition so far. So I thought, now that we've all got Euros fever and it's well and truly underway that we're at the knockout rounds and decided it would be good to do some international football content on here because I've only really been focusing on club football I thought a really great place to start would be East Germany's first and only major international tournament which was the 1974 World Cup in West Germany this World Cup had it all it was set in the backdrop of the Cold War East Germany's first and what turned out to be their only World Cup it was an absolutely amazing one of course West Germany went on to win the competition this is all about the smaller Germany the socialist Germany it's about the day they are at the World Cup about how a side of plucky amateurs who had actually a lot of them ripped up European football at club level how they came to a World Cup and despite never getting far, they did their nation proud and they played some great football along the way and got a very famous win, which we'll be discussing about later on in the video. This is all about the day they are at the World Cup since we're in the middle of the Euros and Germany got out of the group. I thought I'd talk about the day they are at the World Cup. This is an excellent story and really sort of encapsulates East Germany as a footballing nation. I really hope you enjoy the video, guys. Let's jump right into it. Before taking a look at the World Cup, I think it's important to get a bit of background to the East German national team in 1974. Get to know the players, get to know the country, get to know the squad and get to know what East Germany were really all about in terms of football. And the team in 1974, I'd argue, were East Germany's golden generation. A lot of people would argue for the East Germany team of the late 80s and 1990, but I'd argue this East Germany team were the golden generation. They had so many talented players in 1974, and that's why they got the World Cup, played and simple. Now, before 1974, East Germany did have excellent players, don't get me wrong, but East Germany had a nasty habit of not performing when it was needed. A bit like Scotland, and the term I'd like to use is snatching defeat out the jaws of victory. East Germany always ended up messing it up in the groups. They never performed when it was needed. They'd maybe need a point to qualify, and then that would be it. They wouldn't get it. They'd lose to somebody like Albania and wouldn't get through. And it was all very embarrassing for the East German government. Now, East Germany found a lot of success in Olympic football. But of course, as we know, Olympic football criminally, in my opinion, tends to be overlooked when it comes to um, prowess. So when it came to the major stage for football, East Germany never performed. And that might be down to the fact that the East German government viewed club football and Olympic football more importantly than World Cups or Euros because, you know, Olympic football was a chance to get one over on the fact Western bloc countries couldn't field their best players because of the amateur rule. Now, East Germany, like I was saying, were not very good in qualifying. Now, they never, ever qualified for the Euros, ever. In World Cup qualifying, East Germany, I would say they could consider themselves unlucky. Now, they didn't enter qualifying for the 1954 World Cup. Then, for every World Cup between the end of the 74 World Cup, East Germany just could not, they just could not find a way to qualify. And it was really a shame. They, they missed out narrowly in 66. They missed out really narrowly in... 1970 but eventually 1974 they made it they'd done it now they had some really talented players in 1974 like I was saying and the standout start for me personally in that 1974 team was Jürgen Sparwasser now I'm sure you all know who Jürgen Sparwasser is he's a personal hero of mine um, a great player from the golden age of football had he played in the west I think he'd be a bigger name than he is now but Jürgen Sparwasser was East Germany's talisman and Magdeburg's talisman, his local club's talisman, who he played for, his boyhood club. They, of course, had just won the Cup Winners' Cup in 1974, beating a star-studded AC Milan. Again, I'm sure you know, you all know that story. It's been discussed numerous times here on the channel. So, 
the rump of East Germany's national team is made up of that Magdeburg squad, but also some talented players. The national captain Bernd Branch from BFC Dynamo was a very talented player. You had the very talented goalkeeper Croy from Saxony Ring Swickau. You had Joachim Streich, who ironically a year later would end up at Magdeburg from Hansa Rostock. All very talented players, and like I said, firmly East Germany's golden generation. So with talented players, East Germany really had the eyes on the prize of getting to the World Cup. They'd missed out on a Euros, they were wanting to get to the World Cup, and they did it. Now, I think the qualifying was kind to them, and that is what we're going to move on to next. There you go. We're going to talk about the qualifying now, but that was East Germany in 1974, a talented side made up of players that at club level had won a European trophy and some other brilliant domestic household names in East Germany that had really been lighting up the Oberliga and performing well in the Oberliga. And East Germany had a side that were more than capable of performing at the top table, and they did it. So we're now going to look at East Germany's qualification journey. Of course, it goes without saying that East Germany needed to qualify for this World Cup. Not just because it was in West Germany, didn't mean East Germany qualified as well. So, West Germany obviously qualified as the host nation, but Brazil also qualified as holders. Now, that's the way it worked back then, that the holders of the competition qualified automatically as well, which, thank goodness, they've done away with it, because and maybe they should bring it back. Well, maybe get your opinions on that one, but... Brazil qualified as holders automatically and West Germany qualified as hosts. So East Germany had to go through qualifiers and as we were discussing previously, East Germany and qualifying didn't really go well together and they were dealt a relatively tough qualification group. They were drawn in group four with Albania who, yes, they weren't exactly great but were a very plucky side that at times could cause bigger sides a lot of problems. Finland, which by Finnish standards at that time were relatively good, I'd say marginally, the Finland team now were marginally better than that Finland team in the 70s. Um, and I think Finland were just unfortunate that they put, got put in a tough group and we might have seen them at the 74 World Cup. And then perhaps East Germany's toughest opponent, Romania, who were every bit as good as East Germany were back then and had a lot of quality players themselves. Now, the quality East Germany side did not do what their predecessors did and bottle it. East Germany absolutely ran the show in the group. They won five, didn't draw any games, and only lost one game against Romania and Bucharest. There was big wins, a 5-0 humping of Finland um, in Dresden, a 4-1 humping of Albania and Tirana, 5-1 win against Finland in Finland and a 2-0 win against Romania so they only conceded three goals and scored 18 so it was really confident qualifying and this East Germany side like the Magdeburg side that a lot of the players had come from were really beginning to catch the eye especially within Europe a lot of European football experts were looking at East Germany and saying could they be dark horses in the tournament and I certainly think they were so after confident performances against teams that could um, hold their own and getting such big score lines against teams that weren't bad at all, especially that 2 0 win over Romania in Leipzig was huge for East Germany, absolutely huge for East Germany. So it was a big one for East Germany, and they got there. They'd finally done it, they'd done what nobody had expected them to do, they'd done what the East German people were willing them to do. They had qualified for a major international tournament. And this also turned a lot of attention onto the national team from the East German government. They were getting messages of good luck from the General Secretary, Irish Honecker, who was the de facto leader of the country. Good luck from all over the East German government, which really hadn't happened before. And more of an interest within the DDR, more of an interest in football within the DDR, had sort of risen. Now, that had helped, been helped by Magdeburg as well, but football, much like with Scotland this year, football was becoming more and more popular. The whole of East Germany were firmly caught up in football fever. They had done it. They had reached an international, major international tournament. Now, that impressive qualifying held them in good stead. It really, like I was saying, caught the eye of a lot of people. The big wins, especially against Finland. Nobody expected Finland to lose that heavily to... Um, East Germany, Finland in general had actually a disappointing run, they lost 9-0 in Bucharest, but that's besides the point, so East Germany had got out what was a relatively tough group for qualifying and they had made it to the World Cup for the first time, football fever had firmly gripped the DDR, now let's move on to the 1974 World Cup, what this video is all about. 
East Germany had done it. For the first time in over 20 years playing as a national team, East Germany had reached their first ever major international tournament. The buzz in the DDR was huge. It was already ironic enough with the backdrop of the Cold War, of course, 1974, the Cold War was at its full height. The world was wrapped up in East v West, communism v capitalism. It was a very tense time. So it was already ironic enough that East Germany qualified for a for a World Cup being held in West Germany, but things were about to get even more ironic and fate was about to deal the world a very interesting hand. Now, Group 1, Group 1 was of course the hosts group. Now, the first team to be pulled out to face West Germany, the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, was Chile, but it was the third team that would be pulled out the pot that would make things all that more interesting. As the draw master pulled out the ball and read Deutsche Demokratische Republik, the German Democratic Republic, it was a shock. Everybody around the world took a sharp intake of breath. They didn't believe what was happening. The two countries that were the physical embodiment of the Cold War, a physical reminder of the Cold War, were facing off on the pitch in the 1974 World Cup. Nobody could believe what was happening. Like I was saying, East and West Germany were a physical reminder of the Cold War. The two German states reminded us that there was an iron curtain splitting Europe in half between East and West, communism and capitalism, the Soviet Union and the USA. It, the, East, the two German states were just a reminder of that. And they'd be facing off on the football pitch. Two very different countries that in a way were very similar as well were facing off on the football pitch. Jürgen Sparwasser's East Germany, the plucky amateurs, were going to be playing West Germany and Franz Beckenbauer, the professional great football that West Germany played. And then, of course, the other team in that group was Australia, who, quite frankly, were probably just happy to be there. The Socceroos weren't exactly at the height of their powers in the 70s. Football, there was very little interest of in football in Australia in the 70s, more cricket and rugby. So it wasn't exactly a group of death, but it's thrown up in terms of the geopolitics at the time, a very tasty and interesting tie is East were taking on West at the World Cup. I'm now going to look at every game for East Germany individually. After the shock of drawing their ideological rivals, their Cold War rivals and neighbours, West Germany, East Germany had to get straight down to business. In their opener, their first ever World Cup game was against the expected whipping boys of the group, Australia. Now, I've got to say for Australia, the Socceroos played admirably in the game, but East Germany showed up and did what they were expected to do and got, in the end, a pretty confident win. Despite the fact that Australia did defend really well and at times looked impressive in the game, East Germany came out and did what they were expected to do and got a pretty, in the end, deserved and confident 2-0 win. So the breakthrough for East Germany at the Volkspark Stadion in Hamburg came in the 57th minute when Australia man Colin Curran turned it in his own net. That was it. East Germany's first goal at a major international tournament was actually thanks to an Australian. Colin Curran turned it in his own net in the 57th minute and that made the crowd back home in East Germany go wild. Now, not many East Germans were allowed to travel because obviously the flight risk, the defection risk was too risky from the fans. Obviously, they if they're in West Germany unguarded, they'll probably just run away and defect. So only party types and Stasi men and those that they knew were loyal to the regime were allowed to go, but they still went mental in the stadium. Whilst back home in East Germany, people tuned in all over East Germany, schools, workplaces, everybody in their houses, everybody tuned in and celebrated their country's first goal at the first major international tournament. Then, in the 71st minute, the first East German player to score at an international tournament finally put to bed. East Germany's talismanic striker, their all-time top goal scorer, the hero from Fisma, the Hansa Rostock man, Joachim Strike firmly put the game to bed in the 71st minute. So East Germany had done it. It was an opening win in their group stage at the World Cup. They'd done it. Their first World Cup game ever and it was their first win at a World Cup. It was great for the nation. Everybody in East Germany was happy. A confident 2-0 win against a plucky Australia who really put up a good fight. The Socceroos did give a good account of themselves. There was no Martin Boyle back then, unfortunately. If they maybe had Martin Boyle, they could have won the game. But East Germany had done it. East Germany got that opening win, those opening crucial two points as it was back then, 
they were firmly on a good footing starting off the World Cup. So it was great for East Germany to get such a great win against Australia in Hamburg. Next, they moved on to Chile in West Berlin. After confidently winning their first World Cup game ever against Australia, a confident, hard-fought win, East Germany moved on to an altogether more tough challenge in West Berlin at the Olympia Stadium against Chile. Now, Chile had a quality side. It might have not been their best, but Chile still had a quality side in the mid-70s and were firmly expected to get out this group in second. Now, West Berlin and playing in West Berlin was of huge political significance because, of course, the Berlin Wall and the fact that East Germany and their allies in the Soviet Union did not recognise West Berlin's right to exist. So this was a huge propaganda one for the East German government and a reason that... East Germany really wanted to win. Now, more fans from East Germany were allowed into this game because West Berlin was manageable. The more exit visas got granted day passes to go and watch the game. So there was a few more East German fans in the Olympia Stadium than there was East German fans at the Volkspark Stadium. But anyway, East Germany came into the game. Now, it could be argued that Chile were the better team. But against the run of play in the 55th minute, Martin Hoffmann, Magdeburg's striker who sort of usually played second fiddle to Sparvasa firmly put his name in lights and scored for East Germany their second goal at a World Cup and it looked like East Germany were going to claim two wins out of two but after that it was firmly backs to the wall for East Germany and eventually in the 69th minute the inevitable happened with Sergio Amada of Chile grabbing an equaliser. East Germany then held on right till the end and grabbed what some might say was an undeserved point, but they were solid. They Looking at the footage of the game, you can see East Germany were solid at the back. They really did give Chile a good run for their money and claimed a crucial point against Chile. That point was huge for East Germany and that kept their hopes of progression alive. They'd scored in West Berlin. Unfortunately, Chile had pinned them back. Hoffman, who, like I was saying, usually played second fiddle to Sparvas at Magdeburg, had firmly made a name for himself, scoring at the World Cup. And again, East Germany was sort of surpassing expectations and going into the big one, the big Cold War derby, East v West. East Germany had a huge chance at progression after what I'd say was again a hard fought point against Chile. Some may say undeserved, I say hard fought and maybe slightly unlucky not to win but East Germany had the big game next. It all hinged for East Germany on the East v West encounter. Before we take a look at East v West Germany as a football game on a football pitch, it's important to look at the backdrop of the Cold War and the sort of politics behind this game because it was always going to be more than 90 minutes on a football pitch. There was a real sense that whatever German state won, that would be a win for that ideology. If East Germany won, it would be a win for communism. If West Germany won, it would be a win for capitalism. That was the feeling in the world. So this was more than 90 minutes on a football pitch. Now, of course, East and West Germany had been locked in a form of ideological deadlock Cold War situation ever since the end of World War II when the Western Allies formed their sectors together to make a capitalist democracy, West Germany, and the Soviet Union made a communist dictatorship, East Germany. That's what happened and the Germanys were split. It was the physical embodiment, like I was saying, of the partition of Europe between communism and capitalism. Berlin, the former capital of Germany, was split again. West Berlin was an island of free, island of freedom and democracy, whilst East Berlin was the capital of the communist dictatorship. And Soviet Union and America and the other Western allies nearly went to war over Berlin numerous times. Of course, we all know about the Berlin Wall, and the Berlin Wall is what really sort of gave this game the really big political edge. That's Of course, you've got the Cold War going on, it's all about ideology, it's all about communism taking on capitalism on the football pitch, but it was also about the Berlin Wall. To the international community outside of the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet satellite states, the Berlin Wall was an affront. Now, I'm sure you all know about the Berlin Wall. East Germany built it to keep East Germans in, whilst officially saying it was to keep fascists out, and it cut West Berlin off. It was a statement saying, West Berlin, does, we do not recognise it. We do not recognise this island of capitalism in our zone, our country. So the Berlin Wall was viewed as a threat to global democracy and a threat to freedom. So East v West Germany, and the West German government vehemently opposed the Berlin Wall. So the East v West Germany was also a war between the Berlin Wall and East Germany and their... Um, 
security regime, the police state in West Germany who wanted freedom and a united Germany. This what That's what this game was all about. It was so much more than football. It was capitalism against communism. The little guys of East Germany, who Wessies, as they called them, looked down on them as poor against the big capitalist Wessies who were dangerous fascists, as the East German government liked to put about. It was so much more than a football game. This was literally the Cold War on a football pitch. This was capitalism versus communism. This was Germany v Germany. It was Irish Honecker's communist dictatorship taking on the democracy of West Germany. It was it just had so much of an edge to it because of the Cold War. The two Germanys were forged by the Cold War. You could say Germany was the centre of the Cold War, where the Cold War played out its most dramatic moments and they were about to take on each other on a football pitch. Now that we know about what this game meant in terms of the Cold War and the political backdrop, we're going to look at East Germany's opposition, De Vezes, the Bundesrepublik, or as the East German propaganda machine called them, fascists. Well, they were West Germany, and I don't care what the East German government said, they were excellent on the football pitch. This West Germany side is probably one of the best the world's ever seen. The quality on display was amazing. In attack, you had Gert Müller and Jupp Heynckes. In the midfield, you had Gunter Netzer of Real Madrid. In the defence, you had players like Bertie Foggs, and of course, one of the greatest Germans to ever grace the game, Franz Beckenbauer. West Germany were just simply a joy to watch. They played excellent football. All the players performed really well at club level and were playing for some of the biggest clubs in West Germany and in Europe. You know, like I said, Netza from Real Madrid. West Germany were just simply outstanding. A star-studded side that played excellent, beautiful, yet simple football. That's what West Germany were all about. They were all about skill and simplicity. And, of course... To get that instilled in a team, you need a good manager. And that good manager was none other than a certain Mr. Helmut Schoen. Now, Helmut Schoen was an excellent manager. He got this West Germany team playing excellent football. But there was an added twist to Helmut Schoen's tale. He was a defector, as they were known in East Germany as a public flutinger. Yep, that's right. Helmut Schoen was from East Germany. He was actually one of East Germany's best managers, one of their greatest sons when it came to football. But he decided to escape to the West. So this added an even bigger complexion onto the game. They had a traitor managing their Cold War rivals, their ideological rivals, everything that East Germany stood against in a country. One of their own was managing them, or a public flutinger was managing them. And the Stasi and the East German government took illegally leaving East Germany very, very seriously. So this was absolutely huge. Another huge thing was if East Germany managed to win, it would be considered a bit of an upset. Because West Germany, of course, was professional. They had these excellent professional players getting for, for, at the time, top wages at their clubs. And they were rock stars. They were like rock stars. I think Gert Müller was treated like the Ronaldo of his day. Uli Hoeneß, another mem great member of that team, was a very much a rock star figure. East Germany, on the other hand, were very much household names. And guys like Jürgen Sparvassel were quite humble. They held down jobs. They were amateur. They were technically amateur. They didn't get paid to play football at club level. They held down um, normal 95 jobs in East Germany, all part of the socialist collective. So West Germany taking on East Germany was also a battle of professional football and amateur football. So there was so much this game, but East Germany had their work cut out against a top star-studded West German side, but also against Helmut Schoen, one of their own that had defected to the West. This game was set to be a cracker. And so the stage was set. The Volkspark Stadion in Hamburg was about to play host to history in one of the most politically charged games that football was ever going to see. This was it. It all came down to this. The game being dubbed the Bruder Duel. The Duel of Brothers. This game actually meant more to East Germany than it did to West Germany, which made it all the more exciting. West Germany were already guaranteed a place in the second round, whilst East Germany needed at least a draw. If they did not win this game, or at least draw this game, they were out. Losing was not an option for East Germany. If they lost, they were out. They were done. That was them out of the World Cup. So this game meant so, so much to East Germany. The curtain was about to rise on one of the most important games in the history of football. One of the most politically charged, intense games the World Cup was ever going to see. 
As you can see on your screens just before kickoff, one of the most iconic footballing pictures in history was taken as Bernd Blanche, the East German captain, shook hands with the West German captain, Franz Beckenbauer. Beckenbauer, the legend of Bayern Munich, the Bayern Munich defender, the stalwart, one of the classiest defenders the world had ever seen, shaking hands with Bernd Branch, BFC Dynamo, the Stasi club's loyal servant, a real workhorse at the back. These two captains from completely different backgrounds, from completely different ideologies, from completely different countries, shook hands, yet there were countries that were so similar. It was a rare moment of German unity before the duel of brothers, the Bruder duel. This proved that this game meant more than politics. This game meant more than ideology. It was all about Germany taking on Germany. All eyes were on Germany. And one of the tensest and most exciting games of the 74 World Cup was about to take place as the DDR took on the BRD. We're now going to take a look at the lineup, starting off with East Germany. East Germany set up very conservatively for this game. So you had Jürgen Kroy in goal, and then a back five of Kurt Visa, Branch, Kiescher and Wetzlich. In midfield, they had Kreischer and Lauk, with Sparwasser also playing in midfield, although it was expected that he'd drift in and help his Magdeburg teammate Hoffman, who was up front on his own, as a second striker, or Sparvasser would drift in an advanced midfield role and play as a centre forward. East Germany had clearly set up not to lose this game. Helmut Schoen clearly wanted to win this game and had his team set up in a much more attacking 4-3-3 formation, with Müller, Hoeneß and Grabowski making up the front three. Ovath, Kuhlmann and Fluher would make up the midfield, whilst Breitner, Schwarzenbeck, Beckenbauer and Fogs would make up the back four with Meyer in goal. West Germany clearly wanted to attack this game, but it also gave off a sense of arrogance. It gave off a sense of we can afford to play forward and everything like that because East Germany will not be a threat to us. They will play classic Soviet Route 1 hoofball and we will not need to worry about the defence. So West Germany had a sense of arrogance about them but also maybe Helmut Schoen knew how East Germany operated and thought maybe attacking 4-3-3 would be better. And those were the lineups for the game. So with the whole world watching... The most highly anticipated game in the 1974 World Cup kicked off. Capitalism against communism, East v West, Germany against Germany, all kicked off at the Volkspark Stadion. And to say it was a tense game would be an understatement. West Germany played their usual slick passing game that had made them so successful, but the East Germans, plucky at the back, kept absorbing the pressure and the back five did its job with East Germany playing frustrating hoofball and focusing on hitting the West out on the counter. Try as West Germany might, they could not find a way round the East German back line and they went into half time extremely frustrated. The first half they ended 0-0 and the East Germans in the crowd, the select few and all the East Germans watching back home started to believe that maybe they could get this point, that maybe the big West German professionals weren't going to beat them. What would come next was one of the most tense, one of the most historic 45 minutes European football and perhaps world football had ever seen. After a tense first half, the two Germanys stepped back out onto the pitch at the Volkspark Stadion. West Germany had arguably been the better side on the ball, but East Germany's back five had performed its duties well and had been solid, not letting the West Germans through. East Germany had had their chances out on the counter, but Hoffman and Sparwasser were suffering from a lack of support. The West German attacks had been just as fruitless, with them struggling to break down a solid East German midfield and back line that they refused to give in any time soon. The second half followed much the same pattern as the first half. West Germany were playing a slick passing game, whilst East Germany were playing a Soviet-style Route 1 hoofball. But as the game ticked on, East Germany started to play with more and more belief, with the counter-attacks becoming more and more promising, but still neither side could score, and West Germany were beginning to get their chances as well. But still, as with the first half, these chances were fruitless. As the minutes ticked down, the crowd, both at the stadium, on both sides of the border, and around the world, were beginning to believe that like most big games, the hype had got to the occasion and they were going to see two sides ground out an unimpressive 0-0 draw. But then, in the 77th minute of the game, one of the most historic goals in world football was about to be scored. Oh, it's good. Scores. 
Sparwasser. Und Tor! Jürgen Sparwasser had done it. He broke the deadlock and had scored one of the most historic goals in the history of football. He had put East Germany 1-0 up against West Germany. The boy from Magdeburg, who only weeks before had helped win his boyhood club, the European Cup Winners' Cup, had put East Germany ahead. The world could not believe what they were seeing. The amateurs of the East were beating the professionals of the West. The East Germans, lucky enough to be in the crowd, went crazy. No doubt East Germans back at home watching schools, factories, in their homes, they went crazy as well, no doubt. It was happening. East Germany were beating West Germany, seemingly against the odds. In a game where it looked like neither side were going to score, Jürgen Spavas had stepped up and become the hero of a nation. He'd also become the hero of an ideology. He had proved that communism was going to triumph over capitalism, at least on the football pitch. A very tense 13 minutes now lay ahead for East Germany. East Germany managed to see out the game and keep a hold of their slender lead. As the final whistle blew, the East Germans realised what they'd done. They grabbed a very much deserved two points against the big professionals of West Germany. Many of those players were heroes to the players in the East, but they had done it. And in the ideological battle on the pitch, communism had just beaten capitalism. It was a game that had shocked Europe and the world as East Germany did what nobody expected them to. They had came and played excellent football against West Germany and through playing simple, solid, long ball football and being great at the back, East Germany grabbed a deserved win. Sparvas had been clinical and the East Germans came away full of pride for themselves. They had done it. They had beaten a side far superior to them, and they had done it confidently, with many points in the second half seeing East Germany play the better football and being the better team. West Germany had simply been frustrated, and the ideological battle in the view of the East German government, like I was saying, had been won. Communism had triumphed over capitalism on the pitch. The little DDR, the little workers and peasants state, had triumphed over the big evil fascist West Germany in the views of the East German government. East German players couldn't believe what happened. The East German public couldn't believe what happened. The East German press couldn't believe what happened. It was a monumentous occasion for the country. And not just for the fact that they won the Bruder duel, the duel of the two Germanys, but also the fact that this win meant that East Germany would progress into the second round Top of the group. East Germany's World Cup was going excellently so far. And whilst they had a high from the historic win over West Germany, it was all about to come crashing down as they entered into the second round. East Germany were firmly on a high. They'd beaten their West German neighbours against the odds and scored a huge propaganda victory. At the same time, they topped the group unbeaten. But now they faced an altogether more difficult challenge. The 1974 World Cup was different from modern World Cups in the fact that it had a second group stage serving as a second round. And East Germany were drawn in Group A, which could accurately be described as a group of death. They'd have to face Holland, Brazil and Argentina, all top quality sides at the time. And East Germany kicked off their second group stage campaign against Brazil and Hanover. The East Germans played the same game they played against West Germany, intensity, heart, spirit, but unfortunately, unlike their West German neighbours, Brazil were actually clinical and managed to grab a 1-0 win. Many said East Germany were unlucky to get not get a draw, and maybe that's true. But East Germany had got their second group stage off to a bad start. It was about to get even worse as they took on the total football Dutch in De Gelsenkirchen. East Germany now faced the hardest test of the competition an even harder test than playing their ideological rivals. They were playing favourites to win the tournament, Holland. Holland in the 1970s were fantastic. It was the total football in Dutch. That's what Holland were all about. It was the golden age of Dutch football when Holland reigned supreme in Europe but just could not win anything. But the Dutch were, at the time, firm favourites to win the tournament and East Germany fell victim to the Dutch total football. Neskins put the Dutch up in the ninth minute and then Riesenbrink put the game to bed in the 60th. And many argued that it should have been more. East Germany had one of the worst performances of the World Cup against the Dutch. They looked completely all over the place and the solidity that had been around that had got them to this point was there and the Dutch were just unlucky not to score more. That meant, with beyond all doubt, that East Germany were out. They had one more game against Argentina, but at this point, it was purely playing for pride. 
East Germany stayed in Gelsenkirchen for the last game, a meaningless one since both Argentina and East Germany were already out of the competition. East Germany played with pride in this game, but again defensive frailties came home to roost. Streich grabbed an early opener for the East Germans, but they were denied one last hurrah in the World Cup as Hausmann managed to draw Argentina level. East Germany were out. Whilst the draw against Argentina was impressive, it was meaningless. They were going home. After the euphoria of the group stage, the euphoria of qualifying, the euphoria of the win against West Germany, East Germany's World Cup had ended in a damp squib. They faced a tough group and they couldn't deal with the pressure. It was a shame. Many had expected East Germany to maybe, just maybe, cause a shock. But these teams proved too much for them and they were going out with one point in the second group stage. But many East Germans still viewed them as national heroes. We're now going to move on to look at the legacy of the 1974 World Cup in terms of the East German national team. The first legacy of the 1974 World Cup for East Germany is unsurprisingly a political one. The win against West Germany was a huge propaganda score for the East German government. The East German government proved that, at least on the football pitch, communism was better than capitalism, that the evil big fascists in the West had been triumphed by the workers and peasants of the East. The East German government also realised for the first time, like most totalitarian regimes, that football could be used in the favour of propaganda. And it was at this point that many believe the East German government started seeing the uses in politicising football, and maybe, just maybe, this is my own theory, it led down the road to Bay FC Dynamo and their links with the Stasi and their success in the 80s, but nobody will know. But the East German government certainly used the World Cup as a propaganda exercise, encouraging a lot of national pride, which there wasn't a lot of back then, with many East Germans discontented with the regime. And it might have staved off a lot of political protest. The other side of the propaganda is the East German leadership came out and supported the national team and supported players like Sparwasser, which made them look more in touch with the people. So the World Cup was of huge benefit to the East German regime. It was the only time non-gold winners, non-gold medal winners got a big welcome in the DDR when they returned. Despite not getting past the second round, the East German national team were still hugely popular. And the politicians used this to the advantage for photo ops and greeting the team with new cars, wallets, watches, whatever the team wanted, the government gave them. It was huge for the East German players. It was huge for the East German government. So it provided a huge propaganda boost, East Germany became overnight the acceptable face of socialism, unlike the Soviet Union who themselves hadn't done all that great at the competition, East Germany had sort of endeared themselves to the people in the competition, not just in the Eastern Bloc, but in the Western Bloc as well by playing solid football and by proving that on the football pitch, ideology can go out the window and they do have good players, but the East German government used it as, well look at us, we're not the big nasty communists like you think we are, we did actually play some nice football, so it was a huge propaganda score for the East German government and one that the leadership of the DDR used to their advantage to stir up national pride and to show you, yeah, we're actually in touch with the people and that at least on the football pitch, like I was saying, communism can beat capitalism. I'm now going to look at what legacy and football and legacy the World Cup left behind. So the football and legacy for East Germany, the DDR, of the 1974 World Cup is really immeasurable. You can't really sort of describe what the football legacy was. It led to a lot more investment in the game domestically in East Germany. Elite football clubs were formed, which were, of course, football-only clubs which had a lot of money pumped into them from the state, as you will know if you've been watching this channel. Football became more elite in East Germany. They had elite football schools. It was all about encouraging players to come through the system. And for the first time in East Germany, there was a real pride in the national team. Before, a lot of East Germans would have just supported West Germany and young kids would have wanted to be like Gert Müller or Uli Hoeneß. But for the first time, kids were wanting to be Sparvas. They were writing Sparvas on the back of their shirts. They were writing Bernd Branch on the back of their shirts. They were writing Croy on the back of their shirts. They wanted to be like the East German players. And that was absolutely huge. So from a domestic footballing point of view, it increased pride in the national team and increased investment from the government into football and sort of brought football to the forefront and sort of diverted a bit away from the Olympic sports because the Olympic sports were still far more of a priority for the East German government. But unfortunately, the legacy did not have the intended effect that many people were expecting. Many people were expecting East Germany to qualify for tournaments from here on in except 
they didn't. Again, it went back to the old ways of snatching defeat out the jaws of victory and chucking it away at the last minute and everything like that. And East Germany never qualified for a major international tournament ever again. And they lost a lot of their sparkle until the late 1980s. Now, a fun fact I'd like to tack on is East Germany technically did qualify for Italia 90. or in the process of qualifying for Italia 90. But, you know, they just slapped to cease to exist as a nation. But, in the late 80s and then in 1990, East Germany became the East Germany team that would not die. A bit like Hibs. Now, East Germany, in the late 80s, were really impressive. Boasted players like Andreas Tom and... Matthias Zammer, who were absolutely fantastic. The best players that the East German game, or some of the best East German game I've ever seen, apart from the 74 squad, and went on to impress for United Germany as well. This East German team were fantastic, and despite the fact the um, country was crumbling around them, they still managed to be really impressive. So that's when East Germany recaptured their form and recaptured the spirit of 74, but sadly, it was too little too late. And the national team were disbanded along with the country in 1990. So it was really sad for East Germany. They never made it to anything again. But I think the legacy is it created a lot of pride in the national team, which is the main thing. And even today, a lot of older East Germans will talk about Sparwasser. They'll talk about their memories of the 74 World Cup. And they'll look back on it and pride. So it has created a bit of a thing. And, you know, Tony Cruz has admitted he's from the former East that he looked up to these East German players. He was always taught about the 1974 World Cup, despite the fact his family did support West Germany at the time a lot of people became more proud than the national team they realised they're not bottlers they realised they aren't idiots they realised they could actually win games of football and especially the win over West Germany it taught them that they were capable of anything they could beat the world and it was a really you know profound tournament for East Germany it had a profound effect on East German football of course West Germany went onwards and upwards, they went on to win the tournament and then, you know, we know what happened with West Germany and then eventually Germany, Germany, they've been really impressive and they had a spine to build on. East Germany never did qualify again but the lingering memory of 1974 will always last and I think it's a tournament that East Germany could have done better in had they been given a chance. Had it been on the current format, I think, at least quarterfinals. And to me, that East Germany side of the 70s is one of the most underrated teams ever. They had so many talented players, like I was saying at the start of the video, like Jürgen Sparwasser, like um, Bernd Branch. So these players were absolutely amazing. And East, the East German national team still live on in the memories of the older East German citizens that can remember it. That team still live on. So the effect on football is immeasurable. Although it did have some noticeable effects like improvement in investment and more pride in the national team. So there you go, guys. That is East Germany at the 1974 World Cup. A story of just a country that underachieved but got onto the big stage and for a while did impress but then they went back to their old ways and everything like that. So it's, it's a great story. We're now going to cut to the outro. So there you go, guys. That is the story of the DDR at the World Cup, East Germany at the World Cup 1974. I thought it'd be great to do since Germany got out of the group last night and it's in the midst of the Euros. It would be a great video to do. And of course, it's a story of a footballing nation that really underachieved. East Germany have got to be one of the biggest underachievers out there in the history of football. Maybe besides Austria, um, Austria and Hungary, but East Germany massively underachieved. They should have been at more international tournaments. It's sad that 74 is the only one people ever saw them at. They deserve more. And that side are absolutely fantastic. They were amazing and they played their hearts out at the tournament. They were the darlings of the tournament, I'd argue. A lot of people probably wouldn't admit it because of the climate at the time. They were the darlings of the tournament. They played some great football. They got the famous win over West Germany, one of the most historic games of football ever. And I think it really just proved that East Germany were capable but they just never came up to the mark so the 1974 World Cup was great for East Germany and it was great it was a great tournament obviously West Germany and Holland faced off in the final and West Germany deservedly won Holland failed again um, the total football but were amazing and yeah it just it was an amazing competition amazing tournament and East Germany were just so unfortunate to get put in that group of death I think if they'd been put in group B they might have had a chance to um, progress into the further rounds but East Germany were amazing um, at the tournament they had some amazing players it was a real golden generation not just for East Germany as a national team but for the country as well so it's a really great story to tell and these players are legends you know, Jürgen Sparwasser is the most unassuming guy you'd think you know from a little town just outside Magdeburg played for his boyhood club and then scored the winning goal in one of the most important games at the World Cup you know it's 
it's really strange to think, but um, yeah, it's an amazing story and I really enjoyed telling it. So I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it. I hope you've learned something about the East German national team. I know I've not spoke about them um, too much on the channel. Um, it's more about club stuff, but if you want to see more East German national team stuff, please smash that like button. And thank you so much, as always, for the support on the channel. It's been great. I promise you, I will try and upload more. There's more interviews coming out. There's more sort of this co content coming out. There's more unboxings coming out. But it's the Euros, so I'm all cut up in that. But I, did, I do hope you enjoyed the video, guys. I do hope you enjoyed the story of East Germany's first and only major international tournament. And I hope to see you in a while. Remember, smash that like button. Subscribe if you're new. I hope to see you in a while. Jack out.